Well, I'm not paying attention to that. How much does a pad hold? Is it in I don't know the exact volume, but she's saturating a pad in hours. She's bleeding a lot. Okay. But yeah, I don't. I don't know. We thought you'd be able to weigh it. Right? And you would. And yeah. that's the thing. If it's if she saturated that pad now, I'm gonna weigh it so I know how much because okay. it's not like oh they saturated a pad that's 300 mils. It's not going to be. Yeah, it's, it's just kind of ballpark. Yeah, yeah, it's just that. That sign that okay, she's bleeding too much. She shouldn't be soaking the pad that quickly. You just watch the video that I'll draw so I can not be so bad. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently, I do need to post that video. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, what would severe headache or blurred vision? What would that be indicative of? Preeclampsia. All right, preeclampsia. Um, so again, we want to make sure she also knows to let us know when she goes home. If this happens, she needs to notify the health care provider to come back in. Um, calf pain, we need about. Um, sorry, that noise is very annoying. There you go. Thrombophilitis, hemoli. Um, so, again, looking at all of the things that we need to assess using our Rita um, and making sure the patient knows to assess these um, once she goes home. All right, so our vital sign assessment. I already talked about temperature. Slight elevation the first 24 hours. We know that's perfectly normal. We're not going to get super excited, but if it does creep up to 99.8, it's like, okay, I'm gonna keep assessing, maybe check her in two hours instead of four hours, just to make sure that it didn't climb. Her heart rate, um, 40 to 80 beats per minute. Um, we know that she's going to become a little bit bradycardia, have some bradycardia initially after delivery. We're not super, super concerned at that point. If she becomes tacky, we're thinking hemorrhage. Did you have a question, Ashley? Um, 40 just seems quite low. It is. Um, and if she was at like that low 50, I would be concerned, but I know that it's not completely unusual for her to get down to 40. Okay. And the breath is at 60 to 80. And I, some resources have even said 640, and so that's why I got that one from. Um, so, I mean, you can even go 60, 60, 40. Um, respiratory rate, 16 to 20, so she should be within that normal respiratory range. Um, blood pressure within usual range, if, if she's hypertensive, again, back to preeclampsia. Hypotensive would be indicative of what? Hemorrhage. Exactly. So now I start to get concerned. So if the woman does have preeclampsia and she has the high blood pressure, after she delivers, how quickly will her blood pressure go back to the normal range? Ask it one more time. So like, if you have preeclampsia while you're pregnant and during delivery, how quickly after she delivers will her blood pressure return back to normal? It means different. I don't, I mean, she may not completely go back to normal for several days to even weeks. Many times we'll have her on a beta blocker, um, helping with that. So it, everybody's a little bit different. But yeah, it's not like it's, oh, she delivered and now she's here. Okay. Preeclampsia can continue for quite, I think it's six yeah. months. Yeah. So you're wondering like what if it was treating. Okay. Um, the epidural bradycardia is postpartum transient hyperbole chronic bradycardia. That's why they're saying that 40, because that kind of hit my eye too. I was like, 40 is not how yeah. easy to rise. So, but that's what the patient is saying. It's actually a fairly frequent thing, basically overbreaking them down. Yeah. So, that <coughs> stimulation on the vagus nerve just calming everything. Yeah. Exactly. Because she's been bearing down, yeah. which we know when we bear down, that vagus <coughs> stimulation yeah. bringing this down too. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just wondering how I can use that in my day-to-day -day life. Be constipated and bear down. <laughs> bear down right now. <laughs> For a test. There you go. Do the syringe. Let's take a lot real quick. That's what we do for patients with SVT, with um, tachycardia. We have them bear down. Give them a syringe and ask them to blow the plunger out. And that, though they're not going to do it, but that bearing down, trying to blow the plunger out, Causes them to bear down and helps to slow the heart rate down. Mm -hmm. So that does a response. Yeah. Yeah.
for the next test, if you have a syringe turned towards the end of it, I'll, I'll know. Okay. All right. And then pain, um, our ultimate goal, um, zero. Oh, I'm not sure we'll get to that, but we're doing zero to on a pain scale. Or what is acceptable for that patient? So we have a C-section patient. We're not going to get a C-section patient typically down to a zero or two. But what is acceptable for them? If we can get them to a four, and they're like, yeah, I can, I'm okay at four, and I can still manage, then that's fine. So it's really setting that goal with your patient. What's acceptable for them? All right, so part of our physical assessment, um, we talked about um, assessing their breast. Um, when does engorgement usually happen? Day one. Day three. Or day three. So again, sometimes, especially our vaginal delivery patients, they've already got home by this point in time. So that's a lot of patient teaching of what to expect. Um, uterus, um, where do we typically find the uterus right after delivery? Normal umbilicus, and what do we? How quickly does it go through its? One centimeter a day. One centimeter a day. One to two, which is one to fifteen finger breaths a day. All right. Um, bladder is she voiding, or is she completely emptying her bladder? We may need to do a bladder scan to see if she's completely emptying her bladder, and if not, we might need to do a straight cap. Um, doing an order for a straight cap. Um, bowels. Testing for bowel sounds, does she have any distension? Um, lochia, again, when you're assessing lochia, when we're assessing the perineum, we're picking up the gown, pulling back um, the carry pad, and we're looking. Assessing for any clots. Don't forget to turn your patient over because it, she may only have a scant amount, just very few um, clots even on her carry pad, but when you turn her over, that bed is soaked. So gravity always wins. Um, so just make sure, turn your patient over, let's make sure that we're not missing something. How much is on the chest? Um, the episiotomy and perineum, we need our Rita. Um, extremities, huh, I have a couple questions here. That might be something important because I have a couple little notes here, right? So do you down, or two down, 48 to the... I gave you one yesterday. I thought I said 48 to the... Well, there's two there, though. Oh, shoot. What's the difference between a straight cap and a catheter? So straight cap, we're just going in, draining, pulling it out. Versus a, an indwelling or a Foley catheter that we leave in. Yeah, okay. All right, and other things we're assessing her emotional status. Um, is she bonding? Is she paying attention to that baby? Is she talking about them? And counting fingers and toes. Um, is that being in tune with how she's doing and how the, the whole family is doing? Maybe it's a significant other, maybe whatever that might include. This looks familiar, right? We saw that yesterday. We had a ton of repeat. Um, all right, Lokia. These are also important, so scan. She has roughly one to two inches of Lokia on the peri pad, which is approximately 10 milliliters of blood. Light or small, about a four inch stain on the peri pad, so equivalent to maybe 10 to 25 mils of blood loss. Moderate, so I'm with that four to six inches, roughly 25 to 50 mils. And then large or heavy, this is really when we're getting concerned because she's saturating that pad within an hour after changing it. That's when we're getting very concerned. So let's say. Now we can go with the moderate to large. So we go in to do our assessment, and she has kind of in between that moderate to, the, the pad's fairly saturated, not completely. And I do my fundal assessment. It's firm, it's two finger breadth below the umbilicus, it's midline, she just emptied her bladder. What am I thinking? Where could this blood be coming from? More cervix. What ha what happened? A cervix laceration. Might need to make. 
benefit, it could be a cervical laceration. So we want to make sure we're looking. Is there, you know, there's front, this is firm. And when I do that perineal assessment, there might be even a trickle of blood that we notice coming from the vaginal canal. So that's why, okay, every, the uterus is not where this blood is coming from. It's somewhere else. And then I'm thinking, okay, this was a large baby. It was a precipital delivery, a forceps delivery, you know, whatever that might be. But that's when I now need to make sure I notify the provider because they may have to go in and put a stitch in the cervix because that's where the bleeding is coming from. She can still have hemorrhage from a cervical laceration. Um, so I need to make sure I'm thinking those. Do they have to do sutures uh, in the cervix to go back and forth and for pregnancies? And uh, that pressure can you encourage people to dilate? I wonder how bad the bleed <laughs> tear is. I've never heard that it has any hindrance later on. I had a question also about sutures. Um, so like with the episiotomy, are those dissolvable sutures? Yeah. Okay, they don't have to come back in and then Exactly, yeah, they're just, just you screw the cat gut and they're dissolvable sutures. Um, the other thing I would think of, so we've talked about these cervical lacerations. Now I've, same assessment, abs fairly saturated, fairly soaked. Fundus is firm, there's no trickle of blood, so I'm not thinking cervical laceration. What else could be going on? Where else is this blood? Oh, let's back up. Cat's not very saturated, so moderate amount, slight to moderate. But this is firm, but she's showing symptoms of, hemor of shock reflex symptoms. Low blood pressure, a little tacky. What might be going on now? Internal. 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 Somewhere. I mean, where would that be? Fundus is firm, though, so I'm not thinking that the uterus ruptured, so I'm not, so rule that out. Seems like a lot. Urine square? So some kind of increta? Fundus is firm, so that tells me that this evacuates, so I'm not thinking the placental fragment. And it was a precipitous delivery, so she was a very fast delivery. No, because I don't see really any moderate, moderate to, yeah, she doesn't have a lot of blood on her peripat or on, on the chest. Seems like it's really fast. So maybe there's uh, like some, the placenta may have torn and there's a piece of it left in? No, we already talked about that because it's the fundus is firm. Something in the intestines. Nope. 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 Something in the she ovaries. Frozen food. This is the pooling, like the blood clot, where you said it's just going to pool inside until it. Well, couldn't it still be a cervical tear? The cervical tear would still be seeing that trickle of blood would have more blood on the pad. Unless it's pooling inside. Okay. And got her up. Nothing. What about just blood, general blood loss? Like she doesn't yeah. have any more fluid, so she's only. She had 450. Quantitative blood loss after the vaginal delivery. Hematomas. So when they would do a spectrum exam, vaginal hematoma or even um, perineal hematomas can hold a tremendous amount of blood. So if I've assessed everything else, and you'll hear nurses call those skid marks, because as that gets, especially at a precipitous delivery, that can damage the vaginal canal and she can have a hematoma that's filling up with blood in that vaginal vault. So I need to think that of all my other stuff I've eliminated. You guys did awesome with that critical thinking of what could it be, and then getting to, okay, we ruled out everything else. Let's see where this blood's going, because she's symptomatic of excessive blood loss. So with that, though, are they, is she continuing to bleed, or does the hematoma form and then kind of... It fills up. It's just like a, it's like a leak, and it just keeps filling and filling. Would you feel that with palpation on the exterior, or on a vaginal you exam, you might be able to feel. Oh, okay. You're not going to see it from from here. It would be on the a vaginal. Or if you turned her over, you'll go scan the in. You may not see. It's going to be internal. If it's a yeah. vaginal hematoma, you're not really going to see it. She might also complain of vaginal fullness. She said, "Man, I just feel like you know, just really full and heavy down here." But she's not bleeding excessively, so nothing makes you think 
cervical laceration or uterine um, hemorrhage is because the blood is coming from somewhere else. So you're basically getting this from low blood pressure? From signs and symptoms of that she's presented to the shocking. So her blood pressure is kind of starting to drop, she's getting a little tacky. All of my other assessments are negative for symptom for where blood might be coming from. That's why I need to think, what was her delivery like? Even a um, vacuum or a forceps delivery can cause that tissue problem. Um, and it could be when we look like, oh wow, she has a huge perineal hematoma. So they can hold 500 plus mil of blood. They can get pretty stinky. <laughs> so I was thinking it. Yes? Did you have to deal with the um, woman have to go into surgery? Oh, yeah. To drain it? Yeah. Okay. She's going to, yeah, they'll go in. You'll have to cauterize wherever that's bleeding from. You'll have to last, um, lance that hematoma and then find the bleeder and cauterize it. Yeah. All right. Is there a possible placenta of the embryo so that we can be out so it won't bleed? Mm -hmm. We don't have um, tissue dissipating information yet? There's a potential, but less light. I mean, they can't have um, retained placenta after about so if for some reason one of those pieces is still kind of had got left in. So, and this is what we're talking about with scant to heavy. It's actually, um, especially if you have that, you know, less than an hour on the far right side. As is just looking at our fundal massage. We're getting that the fundus of the uterus and just massaging, trying to firm up um, that uterus. Oh look, this is my ear too, which I didn't close for you very well. <laughs> <laughs> Another, so now you're what, 46 questions? 46. <laughs> <laughs> Actually 45, because two slides ago was pretty important too. Two slides ago. Yeah. All right, so emotional status, we talked, um, what we're looking for is how are they interacting? Is she kind of, um, kind of very quiet? But we also want to look at the culture. Is that normal? Because there are cultures that when women deliver, they are defensive. They are not expected to do anything. They are, they are not expected to take care of the child. The family does that for the first week or so of birth. So we also, before we jump into like, oh, well, they're not doing anything. Let's look at the culture. Maybe that's normal within their culture. Um, level of independence or energy levels, that eye contact, that, <coughs> that taking in and the in face, that she's looking, you know, holding that infant and really taking them in. Um, posture and comfort level with the infant. You know, how, is she, how is she doing? And sometimes, you know, first moms, especially if they're not kid people, they're just like, I don't know what to do with this little person. Mm -hmm. It's kind of scary. This is where our teaching comes in. Um, sleeping and rest. Um, and it's okay on the nursing side if she's not seeming to be able to get rest because there's so many visitors, which is one of the positive things with COVID is we don't have as many visitors. But if there's just so many people or phone calls, it's okay to, to assign the door, no more visitors. You know, this is sleeping time from one to three, no visitors. It's okay, because we need her to be rested um, at that point. And then we want to make sure we're alert for any mood swings, irritability, or crying episodes. We talked a little bit. Let's look at the bonding and attachment, so the transition. So you might want to look at these stages. Um, think about what factors are going to affect attachment. So kind of think about how can I, in my assessment, when I get report, what kind of a delivery, what was the, the situation around the pregnancy, um, parents' background, um, and the infant and care practices. Um, clinical attributes of attachment to the proximity is, is the baby in NICU? If she's not able to take care of it, uh, she can go to the NICU frequently um, to see them. Or is the baby thrown out and she's still here? Um, so a lot of things that can have an, an impact. On the emotional state, um, it's the individual person, um, their capacity and commitment to get through it better. So again, table 16.1, paying attention to the positive and negative attachment behavior. So paying attention to that table as well. 
So things that can affect um, that crystal are that ground, um, the infant temperament and the health at birth. I mean, if this kiddo's you know, crying all the time, um, it's not consoled very easily. Remember we talked about the fractured clavicle and this kiddo doesn't like to be held and is happier when we put them back in the bassinet, the more quiet comes in the bassinet. That can be really devastating to a new mom. Even if this is her fourth child, it's like, well, this, this is really weird. Why does this child not like me? He cries all the time. So that's the thing about birth. Um, our care practices, um, the separation we already talked about. Um, I'm not sure why they went on policy and schools and exploring infants. <laughs> I'm sure that's a good one. But anyway, um, intensive care. Um, we have a 23 weeker that we don't really mess with a whole lot because remember we talked about with those very young kiddos can be overstimulated very easily. Light, noise, touch can stimulate them so much that it becomes detrimental and can lead to demise. Um, so we have to be, so that can be really tough. Um, and that's happened in the NICU. The parents are insistent that they hold their baby. And so we have to make sure we educate. I mean, it is still their right. If they want to take the baby out of the incubator and hold them, we just need to make sure we let them know and we document that we educated them as to the dangers of doing that. <coughs> we understand, but we also want to make sure we edu educate them. And then our um, staff indifference or lack of support. We have somebody that um, has different cultural beliefs than we do. And if we go in with just kind of that <sighs> so stupid um, kind of attitude, that can have a negative impact on them as well. So yeah, we don't have to believe everything. We have to be understanding. And say, you know, this is kind of what they, they believe. You know, the parents that are living in a van with a boa constrictor, yeah, that's a tough one, but that's what they do. So it was actually a family that did that. They were discharged, they were living in the back of a van, very happy because they had their bed and everything in the van with a boa constrictor. Mm -hmm. Just really hope that that kiddo made it. So, <laughs> you haven't heard the book, so. The book talks about exploring the infant with being like visually and physically, like touching fingers, toes, nose, eyes, like all that stuff. Which kind of got my mind, why would there be a policy discouraging that? Other yeah. than in the NICU. Okay. Yeah, I guess that would be where we would, you know, not want them to messing with them a whole lot. So it's just not really a policy, it's just a gut of view of things and that you look at policy and you don't know. Right, yeah, definitely. All right, so teaching topics. Well, another great thing. <laughs> Maybe I should make this into a SATA <laughs> of some kind. Drag and drop, something. All right, so pain and discomfort, you know, when things, remember the lochia that if she transitions to lochia serosa and regresses back to rubra, that's something that's not a good sign. We don't want her to regress. Um, immunizations, if she was um, rubella non-immune uh, during pregnancy, remember we're not going to give her, her immunization for rubella during pregnancy because of the, the harm to the fetus. But we want to check that. And if she was rubella non-immune, we'll offer that immunization before she goes home because we want them to wait at least 30 days before becoming pregnant after administration of that um, immunization. And this is the perfect time because the likelihood of getting pregnant in that length of time is much less. So we want to make sure we're checking that. This time of the year, we're offering you know, the flu vaccine, um, things like that. Uh, we talked to about nutrition, um, our activity and exercise we talked yesterday when the baby sleeps is a great time to feed him to sleep. Probably not a good idea to put them upstairs in the sun and go down and vacuum because you forget that they exist upstairs and you can't give them cup. That's what I do. <laughs> so my, my youngest one, that's why she's darker than the older one because I provide her in the sun. <laughs> so, <laughs> Turn the vacuum off and what's that noise? <laughs> Whole town upstairs. <laughs> It was, I had her in the sun because she was getting a little yellow and then I thought, well, I can't just do nothing. So I 
Yeah. So they, they, they both just survived despite everything <laughs> that they had no idea. Did you have a pretty good relationship with CPS? <laughs> <laughs> so there is another story with that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, let's see it. So the beauty of living in small communities, so my our oldest daughter was she's in kindergarten and it was what are we having Labor Day? Anyway, they were playing in the at the roping chute. They're pinning a rope and they open the chute and it pops in the face. So she had a black eye and just before school started, she had fallen off the swing set and broke her arm. So this is like a week different. So she had a big black eye, so I called our physician who lived just down the road. I was like, hey, on your way home, could you just bring me some you know, Tylenol codeine? Because she has this big old black eye and a broken arm, so he stops by the house, brings me some Tylenol codeine. And as he's walking out, he's like, and I'm going to call social services, which he didn't, but he was being very sarcastic. But anyway. <laughs> you keep alleging these kids are still alive. <laughs> <laughs> I went to high school with one, so. Oh, see, she, she is still alive. Yes, I was at least one. Fair enough. Fair enough. How much have we been paid? <laughs> and she was here just the other day, walking through, so delivering us some beans. So, anyway. so, yes, the beauty of living in a small community. All right, so um, activity and exercise comes back to us on that one. Um, lactation, so she's choosing to um, breastfeed, being supportive. Um, in springs, hopefully we have a, you guys have a chance to work with the lactation consultant lactation nurses. They are amazing. They're all certified lactation nurses and just um, have a lot of good um, tips and tricks to help moms be successful. And just because it's a mom's second, fifth, fourth, whatever child doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. First child may have been a piece of cake, latched on, just took to it very easily. Next child, not so much. So everyone's a little different. So we want to really work with her, helping her to be successful um, with that. Um, if she's choosing not to, to breastfeed, we're also going to talk to her about the binding we talked about yesterday and how she can work with um, depressing hormone production. Um, sexuality, contraception, um, we want to make sure she knows not have um, vaginal intercourse until she's um, had a six week follow up. Um, and then make sure she knows when those follow up appointments are, are going to be. So, as we um, are nursing management, definitely um, optimal cultural care. So, looking at box 63, um, promoting the comfort, heat, our uh, cold and heat applications. So, typically the ice packs um, used to be to help with. The episiotomy healing, we used to put heat lamps on the perineum, but they also found evidence based practice and was actually um, not as helpful as they once thought. That we were looking at more infections and infection rates. Um, some times for the after pain, getting her a, a heating pad is many times helpful. So just kind of asking, you know, what might be beneficial and culturally too. Um, topical, the, the topical spray when she had tears or episiotomy. Uh, and then analgesics, uh, ibuprofen, uh, things like that. Um, assisting with elimination, make sure she's getting up, emptying the bladder completely, um, and then um, bowel movements. And we know that may not even happen while she's in the hospital, but talking with her about exercise, water, her colates, um, things like that. Didn't you say it was like two to three days? Two to three, two to two to three days. Um, to get back on speaking topic, on contraception. Um, I guess how long should the mother wait until they get back on like oral contraceptives? And that's typically <laughs> kind of if she's breastfeeding, kind of what her plans are. That's more I'm thinking she's talking with her provider. I don't it's gonna be very individual um, on that one. really cool little and this is outlined in your textbook it's in a table I don't know the table number but I, I know it's in the table uh, but using the bubble um, bubble he and he just has the bubble he has another e on there um, but in our assessments breast uterus bowel bladder lochia episiotomy menorrhea colon sign and emotional status colon sign I want to get some reading on that Pretty much says what it's going to be. Yeah. We still do it, 
it still thinks that it has enough negative. It doesn't always give us that, oh, look, they have a blood clot, and it can also have the negative connotation. But even just having them dorsiflex and asking them to have pain. Um, okay. And I think part of that is just reminding us we need to do the assessment for trauma. And that's on what page? Oh, it's in the nursing care plan. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it has an E instead of the H, so. so. Just a, a mnemonic to help you remember. It tends to be a really good drive and not feel something. Where we have Josh? Yeah, 43. <laughs> 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 All right, um, so intervention. So promoting uh, activity, rest, and exercise. We do want early ambulation. Um, with some resting. Um, exercise programs, Kegel exercises. So one of the things when they're in the hospital, what, I think pretty much universally, when she's up in the, walking in the hallway, which we do encourage, taking the infant with her, we don't want them to be carrying the infant out in the hallway. They must be in the bassinet, the little rolling bassinet. Why would that be? Why would we not want her or even significant other, the dad, why don't we want them carrying them out in the hallway? Dropping. 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 Exactly. Dropping is very expensive. Hmm? Very expensive. There, there you go. <laughs> so that's what, and so as students, if you happen to see somebody carrying their baby, you know, out in the hallway, you can say the policy is they have to be in the bassinet when, that, um, when they're out of the room. Um, so even as a student, you can call them out on that. Also making sure they know where the little security bands, where they can go with that security band. Um, because we will set off all the alarms and then everybody comes running and they lock down the whole hospital and then it becomes a big thing. So. Can't imagine somebody wanting to take one of those little tights put them in your bag. But it does happen. Several years ago, somebody actually got through all of the security elements at Memorial, and they finally caught them on the interstate with a child they had taken from the unit. Like walking or like they caught them in the car? And they were in the car. They put them in a, a satchel in the back and got them out. And the little wristband didn't set off or anything? Somehow, I don't know exactly how that they got by that one, but yeah. I wonder if they cut it off. But well, when you cut it off, it goes off. But if they were that fast, they could have snuck out, yeah. cut it off, and then took off. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's set up that if you cut it, um, yeah, it will. It will go off. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Do they have a car key? No. 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 I tried it. Yeah. Why did you try it? People weren't offering. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and the jail time is pretty minimal, so. Yeah. 